It's my pleasure to introduce Jim Lynn, who is one of our former fellows. He uh, was uh, with us in about 2008. Uh, he um, went to the university, he did his residency at University of Maryland, and uh, currently is at the University of Kansas, doing a great job. Uh, some interesting projects, I know, and uh, he's going to share some of his knowledge with us today. So. I would like to introduce Jim Lynn, a, just a great friend, a fant fantastic surgeon, and a really, a really a nice man. <laughs> Morning, Jim. Morning. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I have what uh, I have a talk here uh, on coding um, in otolaryngology, but I'm going to focus on otology. And I know it's not absolute riveting, not a lot of blood and guts or gore, but this is important stuff, uh, particularly for the fellows to know and, and for people to understand the process a little better, uh, because a lot of our reimbursement or all of our reimbursement depends on coding. Uh, and a lot of it seems unfair or doesn't make much sense at all. And so that's why I wanted to discuss basically why, uh, why things are the way they are and what we can do to help ourselves out if we can. And um, also give some examples on, on how some things just don't make sense and things we can do to fix it. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, I am the, uh, I'm the CPT advisor for the American Academy of Otolaryngology. So in other words, I help interpret uh, for the entire field what is reportable and what's not to the AMA CPT group. They have the final say uh, regarding which codes are appropriate to use with which procedures. And that has quite a bit of billing ramifications down the road. What I say doesn't reflect anything from KU or, or the Academy uh, exactly. Some things they may not appreciate me saying, uh, some things they do. So uh, the objectives, we're gonna go over why this is important and, and examples of the CPT process. Um, we'll talk about how it's done and, and how we get the values for our codes. So what first led me to be interested in this whole topic is, is my brother's a neurosurgeon. He does a lot of spine surgery and um, he, he gets uh, reimbursed by what we call a relative value unit or the RVU, which is uh, the AMA and CMS's way of saying how important and how hard your work is and how much you should be reimbursed. Uh, Medicare has a rate per work relative value unit RVU of about $35, $34, $35 per work RVU that lowest it's been since 1990. Uh, and that's not accounting for inflation as well. So we can see how bad things have gotten from government reimbursement. And so you'll see and recognize this code here, 69643. That's our tympanoplasty uh, or intact canal wall temp mastoid code. Um, the work RVU valuation for that's about 15.59. And then I was talking to my brother. He, he says he gets about 40 or 50 uh, work RVUs for a single level uh, anterior cervical discectomy infusion, which takes him about an hour to do. And these are the three codes he uses to report that. That's about 40, 40 to 45 work RVUs for an hour's worth of work. So this discrepancy in and of itself, and arguably a temp mastoid should take about an hour and 15 minutes to up to three hours, depending on the level of disease. Yet we've got this, you know, single code saying, single value saying we get about a third of, of what my brother would get for a single level ACDF. Of course, there's variations on how hard those are as well. Uh, but this, this discrepancy and, and inconsistency was what really piqued my interest. And I, I'm giving this talk I'm open to questions. Please feel free to interrupt me. This is a very informal talk because it's new to a lot of people. Um, so I encourage you to ask me any questions as we go along.
So when I did fellowship uh, out there, we, we had um, different codes for skull-based procedures. Um, for our translabyrinthine craniotomy, we used to report 61596 and 61616. The 61596 is a skull-based code for approach to the tumor, uh, transcochlear, um, and the 61616 is uh, for removal of an intradural um, neoplastic or infectious or inflammatory lesion. Um, if you tally up the work RV used for these two, it's about 40 and uh, an extra 45. So about 80, 80 some work RV used for this. Now, an older code uh, out there, 61526, uh, this was, I think, the original translabyrinthine craniotomy for removal of a cerebral schwannoma code. Their total there is 54.08, which is significantly lower than, than, than the skull based codes. And so um, as I've traveled around the country and worked in different places and talked to different people. I try to figure out, well, what's the, you know, which one should we report? Obviously, if I had a choice, I'd report these two. Um, and finally, somebody actually asked the AMA what we should do. And so uh, their answer in the CPT assistant article is that if you're taking out a vestibular schwannoma, basically regardless of how big it is, it should be reported with one single code 61526 because that was the original intent of the code. Um, this obviously doesn't make a lot of people happy. Um, and if you guys are, you know, if you're still getting reimbursed for it, uh, the skull based codes, that, that's, that's good news. But if, um, if payers ever really want, ever cared enough to really want to get funds recouped for payments or overpayments, they can always refer back to this code or this, this CPT assistant article as, as proof, as the quote unquote ruling on how uh, translabyrinthine craniotomy for removal of vestibular schwannoma should be reported. So um, just be careful. Uh, there are rules out there and, and given my position as CPT advisor for the American Academy of Otolaryngology, uh, I, I, this is what I report because I have to lead by example. Anybody have any questions so far? No, it's uh, overwhelming to me. So I just let other people do it. But it certainly has changed a lot since I first started. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, this is very, very valuable, especially for the younger people who have to understand, uh, make sure they do code correctly and or make sure they understand the whole process. All right, so uh, stapedectomy uh, codes, um, 69660 is your run-of-the-mill initial stapedectomy. The revision is 69662. 69661 is a stapedectomy with foot plate drill out. Uh, I, at one point in time, uh, had one of my former residents call me up and ask me, Jim, why, why would you ever report 69660? Because you always have to drill something to put the stapes prosthetic in. So I always bill 69661. I always get paid a lot more for it. And as I shook my head, I said, yeah, uh, Dan, this is um, you know, it's for actually having to use the drill to thin out the foot plate enough so that you can actually fenestrate it in a controlled fashion. It's worth a lot more. It's uh, 15.92 work RVUs versus I think about 12 over here. Um, uh, and if you continue to report, if, if every stapes of yours, uh, and this is what's going to happen, is a foot plate drill out, you're going to get audited. And when they audit you, they're, they'll probably not only, whoever's paid you for it, will probably not only recoup the money that you took in excess, but they also charge you a penalty. So if you're doing something beyond the normal at a higher frequency, uh, then, then be, just be careful because this opens you up and puts a spotlight on you. So you have to be very careful with, with what you report. Saying that I make so much more money uh, from it isn't a good reason, and that's not something they would understand. Um, what exactly is involved in the work of the procedure? Uh, the AMA not only has a CPT arm, they also have what we call the rock arm. Uh, they're the ones who determine what's involved and how much each value, each procedure is valued. And they typically have classic vignettes regarding the work performed and the work performed has to be similar to what they've described. Uh, if not, then they'll, they'll say that you've done less than that. 
And um, typically the ruck vignettes are available through the AMA at somewhat of a cost. Um, the stapedectomy and revision and the foot plate drill out procedures are so old. Those are, those probably got valued uh, originally through Harvard back when the RVU system rolled out in the mid nineties. And so they don't have a vignette in there, but if, when there's no vignette labeled or discussed in the rock system, they, um, they ask us what's involved in a uh, stapedectomy of the foot plate drill out. And obviously I'm not gonna say that just because you put a hole in the foot plate, it's a drill out. All right. <clears throat> tympanoplasties. Now, one thing that interests me about this whole coding process is a lateral graft tympanoplasties, which some, yeah, I know all of you are familiar with at this point. You make a cut behind the ear, get a huge piece of fascia. Um, you uh, strip out the skin of the ear can anterior ear canal, and then you remove the whole drum in, this, in the process. Then you do a, a large canal plasty and you rebuild the whole ear drum. It, it should take about 45 minutes to an hour and a half to do, depending on, on how much middle ear work is performed and what your proficiency is with it. You have a posterior inferior perforation uh, that you do transcanal. You harvest a piece of fascia or perichondrium separately. Um, and that's a lot less work and a lot less risk. Yet, for lateral graft and panoplasty, you can only report one code, 69631. It's inclusive of the canal plasty. Uh, also, if you get fascia through your postericular incision, the incision that you made to do the surgery, you can't bill for that separately. Whereas in many cases, if you do a transcanal tympanoplasty and you harvest tragal perichondrium, you can bill for that separately because you use a separate incision from that used to approach. So paradoxically, if you have a huge cholesteatoma in the middle ear and you do a lateral graft tympanoplasty, you get paid less. You get paid... 10 work RVUs versus say 17, or if you use cartilage, 18. So that, that's a, it's a huge inconsistency in the process. A lot of people ask, why don't we have different tympanoplasty codes for those with cholesteatoma and without? And again, these codes haven't been revisited or revalued, our ear codes, thankfully, haven't been revisited or revalued in several years. So we have a decent valuation for it. Uh, if we were to try to add on codes and open them up, the values would more than likely go down. And so that's why when individuals complain to me about not having different levels of tympanoplasty codes or not having a cochlear implant removal code um, that's distinct for the procedure, it's best to leave it alone unless we want to risk decreasing our valuation. Okay, uh, this one's meant to incite some people here. Um, so uh, it's a comparison here. Uh, and this is what I, I personally, personally consider a, a big problem with otolaryngology in general. And I'm not sure if many people understand this very well. So I've given the work RVUs for a canal wall up tympanoplasty with mastoidectomy, which is 16, and uh, a uh, retrosigmoid craniotomy for removal of vestibular schwannoma, which is 57. Then I've got this weird code here, 31295. That's a, a maxillary sinus balloon sinuplasty. And uh, the reason this is interesting is not because the amount of work done. I, uh, it's, um, I'm going to shrink this down here. Not because of the work done, it's uh, you, the work done is 2.7 work RVUs. And uh, if you were gonna do it in your office, that's the non-facility um, practice expense. Practice expense, it's 52.3 work RVUs because the balloons are so expensive. And we know that you know it's, it's almost become a pandemic here with the, the, uh, the balloon sinuplasty. And the reason why it's so, I guess, favorable or um, I would say enticing for people to do in their office, you get, you get about a half a balloon's worth of value for each uh, sinus you dilate. And so if you, if you were to dilate six sinuses and instead of using three balloons, you use one balloon, you get an extra 104 RVUs 
paid to your practice for not using uh, extra balloons. So it's not even the amount of work that's done. So can if you can imagine, uh, I don't know, uh, John or, or, or Daryl, if you can imagine getting paid the work of all of twice that of, of uh, a retrosigmoid craniotomy for removal of vestibular schwannoma uh, in your office simply by choosing to not open up two packs of balloons, um, that, that's the reason why uh, people like to do these balloon procedures. Any comments? Nope. <laughs> so, and it, it turns out, I guess, uh, once you see the bills, the dollars roll in, some people actually will choose to use single use balloons in, in, in cases uh, across multiple different patients and, and uh, actually not buy any new balloons at all. Um, this is a, a lawsuit of a, a physician in North Carolina who, who had done that and used uh, single use balloons for several different patients. So uh, just be careful, you know, getting, you know, just keep a hold of yourself, keep, rem remember why we're doing what we're doing. It's to help patients out and not so much to make a lot of money. So where do these values come from? They come from us, really. Um, again, we have this RUC committee that um, is created by the AMA that allows us, uh, that, that is composed of, of delegates from every specialty. Uh, and after a, a code is created, uh, it goes to them. Um, once the code is created, it goes to our, our AAOHNS RUC team, they send out a bunch of surveys to Academy members. And our surveys that they have, the RUC surveys are the only ammunition we have in devaluation of the codes. Um, so if you get a RUC survey, please don't ignore it. Uh, what our RUC team has to do is take the survey data and there's strength in numbers and there's strength in consistency and say, this is, this is the amount of time it takes to do the procedure. This is how intense it is. Um, it's a very granular survey, how many post-ops you have. Um, they ask you to compare the new procedure in mind uh, to other procedures you may or may not have performed for intensity, the amount of anxiety and stress. And um, most importantly is the time, time you spend talking to the patient before, time that you spend you know, talking to the patients afterwards, um, time it takes to position the patient, all of that. That's our only ammunition um, is, is these surveys. And so if you get one, please fill it out because if we don't have enough information, then those people that we present to, which would be delegates from other specialties, they're, they're gonna drive the value down. And the reason why that is, is because um, Medicare is probably the largest, one of the largest payers in the country. There's a budget neutral system there. So any extra dollars that they give to us for a new procedure is money out of their pocket eventually and somehow. And so they, they, they sort of just throw us in the ring and basically have us fight out those values. <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to uh, switch gears and talk about how um, uh, our field, a lot of uh, any field, any medical field likes to try to squeeze a, a new procedure under an old code and what might happen. So the vestibular evoked myogenic potential, which is intended to check for inner ear third window and, and perhaps other things, but the most important thing is to check for inner ear third windows. Um, we didn't really have a code for that. Uh, and it, it took, what, it's been 18 years or at least 18 to 20 years uh, since we've been fixing superior canal dehiscence for this problem. And <clears throat> for the first 10 years of performing vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, a uh, lot of us have used the old ABR for thresholds code, 92585. Well, somebody keeps a track of these codes. And so we squeeze the vamp into the 92585 code. And over the uh, early 2000s to 2010s, the, the utilization for, for that code went up exponentially. And the AMA keeps track of that and CMS keeps track of that. 
And so us in audiology and, and neurology being the biggest user of the code, they, they come to us and say, why the heck is 19585 growing so rapidly? Uh, and our best explanation is because the vestibular evoked myogenic potential code was, or uh, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials were being reported with 92585. And so after certain discussion and straightening it out, they, they basically wanted to clarify that through the CPT system that you cannot use 92585 for, for uh, VEMP testing. Um, they recommend an enlisted code. Nobody wants to report an enlisted code because it has no value with it. And Medicare has minimal value associated with it. Uh, so whereas it's appealing to squeeze a, a different procedure that's novel and doesn't have a code with its own into an old code, this is what happens. It gets tracked and we get asked about it. And then we have to say, this is what we have to do, use an unlisted code. And so we got together with... Um, the audiologists and the neurologists, and we created a new set of codes for vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. And in doing so, we also opened up all the ABR codes uh, because those are related. They asked us to straighten those out too. So when, when we report a procedure that doesn't fit a code quite right, and that code being used grows in value, this is, what's, this is what'll happen. And the valuations of all of these, you know, we, it's great we have a new VEMP code, um, but these values probably dropped as we did so, which is never a good thing. Same thing happened with uh, posturography. Now, I know you guys don't like posturography uh, out, out there where you guys practice, or maybe maybe your uh, vestibular guy is not there anymore, used to. I'm not sure. John, is did, did he use posturography? Uh, Ted, Ted? Is it Ted? No, he didn't. Uh, we never used that. No, okay. It didn't, it didn't really. I personally don't find it very much helpful, but I know that it's it's a procedure a lot of people like to do. Yeah, you know, So CMS didn't really think it was that helpful either, and so um, you, it wouldn't get paid for. But around sometime around uh, 2010, 2011, CMS started to pay for it, and then shockingly, <clears throat> or not shockingly. The number of times this code was reported grew up exponentially. So in 2018, we between 2010 and 2018, it went from 21,000 uh, times reported for Medicare to 45,000. After they started um, started reimbursing for it, and we they looked back and see to see who the most common uh, fields were that reported it, and it turned out it was well internal medicine and family medicine. Because this old code, 92548, used to be defined by just computerized dynamic posturography. And so it, it probably wasn't very well clear regarding what was involved. And almost certainly uh, internal medicine and family medicine, those, those individuals who reported the code probably didn't have an expensive posturography computer device. And more than likely uh, had them standing up on a foam pad and reporting it. And because of that, we were again asked with neurology and audiology to clarify this. And because of that, we worked together to create these new, more distinct and well-defined codes for posturography. So again, another example of why we shouldn't try to squeeze uh, uh, new procedures or, or uh, inappropriately list these codes because somebody's watching growth and value, uh, growth and utilization. Um, and it won't happen right away, but eventually it will get caught. Now, I don't know if you guys have kept in mind, we used to always bill 20926 for free tissue graphs and uh, fat graphs and so on and so forth. Um, that got deleted and replaced by 15769, which I think is lower in value uh, than, than 209226 used to be. Um, and the reason for that, again, is, is the same. And the answer for why that happened is, is based on this parenthetical down here. Um, Platelet-rich plasma, which is of, I personally think, questionable benefit, uh, depending on who you ask, um, was being used, injections of such were being used to report, uh, were being reported with 20926. And so 
they basically asked us to redefine this whole set of free tissue grafting codes. So now we have this newer, slightly lower valued code for fat and uh, fascia and perichondrium. All right, uh, that one you're probably not that interested in. Um, that one you're probably not terribly interested in either. Uh, I, I bring up 30117 um, because a lot of people are using this as a catch-all for um, uh, procedures such as uh, trying to re repair collapsing nasal valves or ablating the, uh, the uh, posterior nasal nerve for chronic rhinorrhea. Um, Again, this is probably not the appropriate code to use uh, for that. Um, it's not worth that much in value for the amount of work you do for it, uh, but uh, you, you still get paid decently for the practice expense when you do perform it. So, feel like I'm talking to the uh, um, the people who <laughs> may have lived through this. So, uh, why why do we have a, a um, a standardized process for creating codes and so on and so forth. Well, uh, it, it tended to correspond with the creation of, of Medicare uh, around the mid 60s. Uh, how I imagine things happened back then, or is that the Medicare officials who were, were getting random bills for different procedures of different amounts and so on and so forth. And they just said, no, we're not gonna, we're not, we need to be able to find a way to standardize this a way to uh, standardize the language and a way to standardize the way we we're, we we're re reimbursing for these procedures. And, and so um, they create, they wanted to create these, this coding system, uh, but they didn't have the manpower to do it. So they gave it to the AMA. The AMA owns the whole CPT process. Um, and basically how the process works with us is that in the grassroots talks to the Academy and and uh, eventually I get involved to see if it's a good idea to create a new code um, with the physician payment and policy work group and the academy leadership. And then I write up this huge proposal for a new code uh, to the AMA CPT group and they accept it or they don't accept it. Uh, once the code is created, the CPT bounces up to the RUP group that creates the value for it. Again, very important. And then um, uh, our, our RUC team works at the academy to send out the surveys for how we value it. Again, I can't stress the importance of these, these surveys. They, they seem painful to do, and they are painful to do, to be honest with you, but they only should take about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, there's power in numbers. Um, you have to be honest. Uh, they will throw out outliers. So if you say it, it takes you six hours to do a cochlear implant, well, maybe, maybe that might be the case, but they'll throw that out. Um, because it's an outlier. Uh, and when our RUC group takes the survey times um, to the RUC panel and delegation, they, they don't accept our median values for times. They assume that the surveys have some degree of lying in them and they take the 25th percentile. So if, if they if we get the 25th percentile for our time and propose values resulting for that time, then we've actually got a win. And that's pretty depressing if you think about it. Um, so if you complain about why you get such a poor value for say the new OSEA procedure, but you didn't fill out the survey, then, then don't complain because you were part of the problem, unfortunately. So uh, there, there are two types of CPD codes, category one and category three codes. Uh, category one's the one we're kind of used to reporting. Um, it's a, <clears throat> each CPD code is meant to describe a distinct procedure for a distinct indication. Um, category one's the one we're used to reporting. It has to, the procedure has to be FDA approved um, and there have to be certain literature requirements it is valued, which is which is nice. That's why we want to have a, a category one code in most cases. Uh, the uh, amount of literature to support a new paying code or category one code is is fairly stringent. Um, in general, uh, at least a systematic review of 
cohort studies. Otolaryngology is a problem because much of what we do in otolaryngology, you know, as whereas they may be huge case case series, they're still case series. And so that puts them down to level four evidence, which uh, doesn't meet the minimum literature requirement for getting a new payable code, as long as it's not for humanitarian use. So uh, the category three codes, and these are interesting codes that ophthalmologists and orthopedic surgeons use pretty frequently. Again, they're not valued, um, but all they have to really be done is uh, all, all it takes to get one of these codes is support from the specialty and it being performed in the country. Um, that's really it. And uh, it's not valued, but many times, and I think ophthalmologists do this frequently, is they'll They'll just use category three codes um, and they will negotiate with the insurers to get them reimbursed for it and they get paid for it. And then uh, they just go from one category three code to another, but they, they have a, a system in place where they, they discuss this with, with payers. Not sure how they do it, but I'd like to know. Uh, for instance, the Eustachian tube balloon dilation, uh, I was involved in, in this um, procedure. Again, it's FDA approved. Um, so that, that helped. Um, there was no um, distinct procedure for eustachian tube balloon dilation. People use different codes to fit in. Um, and we had to talk to the AMA CPT group about how often it was being done. It's, it's, a, it's a labor of love to get all this information um, uh, gathered. And often we have to rely upon industry to do it because uh, we don't have the resource to do it ourselves. All these databases um, are hard to interpret and they cost money to get into. And finally, we had to reach a level of evidence. Um, and fortunately, uh, they, there were, I think, two randomized controlled trials, randomized controlled for only six weeks, really, but that's because the FDA made them limit it to six weeks. Um, that gave them a level of evidence of 1B. And that was the minimum literature requirement for it. And so now, um, well, now we have new codes for eustachian tube balloon dilation. Um, we had to uh, basically argue that these codes were completely different um, from eustachian tube balloon dilations. And we had to argue that these old deleted codes um, were in existence prior to the creation of the balloon for eustachian tubes so that these were not the codes that were uh, intended to report eustachian tube balloon dilation. So a lot of, lot of moving parts involved in the process. And again, I don't know if you guys, you guys probably know this by now, but there is a code for eustachian tube balloon dilation out there uh, for unilateral or bilateral. And the, and the reason why they um, have this set up for unilateral and bilateral is because each one is gonna take one balloon um, we certainly can't have people reporting this code and just getting reimbursed uh, for half a balloon, um, either a facility or a, a practice. We have to have one balloon in each, each procedure, uh, either unilateral or bilateral. Any questions so far? You guys are awfully quiet. Overwhelming. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> believe it or not, um, the superior semicircular canal dehiscence um, uh, is, is a procedure that's been performed for 20 years. We have V code for the, the V diagnostic um, test for it, the VEMP code now. But there's not really a code for the procedure itself. People will use different things, um, different skull based codes. Some people use craniotomy codes to report it. Um, there's your dehiscence right there. But the truth is, back in 2014, somebody asked the AMA, hey, what do we use to report middle fossa um, plugging or repair superior semicircular canal dehiscence? And they said, since there is no distinct procedure in, intended to, or no distinct code for a procedure intended to report this, their response is it's got to be unlisted, which, which stinks. Yes, it does. Um, and what I do here at, at KU is I, uh, I do report this code, but then we've, we've talked to payers to compare it to 62121, which is a craniotomy repair of 
encephalocele, the skull base. Um, and so if, you know, if again, the, the, the ramifications of this in 2014 is if, if you're reporting skull base codes or whichever to repair a superior semicircular canal dehiscence, and I find it a stretch to uh, uh, report putting bone wax or bone pate over a dehiscent superior semicircular canal as, as a definitive excisional or removal lesion such as 61616 or 61606. I don't, I, I find that a stretch for the work uh, for what those codes are intended for to be reported for simply putting bone wax or resurfacing uh, a dehiscent superior semicircular canal. And so one of my goals in the future is to actually come up with a distinct code for uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence repair, either done transmastoid uh, for one set in middle fossa and it's probably better to do plugging versus resurfacing as separate, separate types of procedures. Office otology. We're uh, hopefully at all kind of familiar with these codes that are, uh, that are performed. Uh, binocular microscopy or removal of impaction. Uh, removal of uh, serum and impaction is, it's interesting in that uh, if you were, are to report uh, removal of serum and you have to document what instrument you used. Um, uh, microscope, interestingly, is not part of the procedure. So you don't necessarily have to use a microscope. You have to describe the instrument you used. Um, and you have to document that the serum was indeed impacted. The, uh, the reason why microscope is not uh, part of this code anymore is because uh, your general practitioner that removes serum and when they try to report it, they, they don't have a microscope. This code used to include microscope. So they took microscope out, they created a new code 69209, which is just lavage or simple limited removal of serum without instrumentation. Um, and uh, interestingly, you cannot report 69210 with microscope, although that's not a component of 69210 anymore. They still won't let you. And uh, you can report a 50 modifier, but you're probably not going to get paid for it. Um, mastoidectomy debridement, uh, simple and complex. Um, I think if you bill every mastoidectomy debridement as a 69222, uh, you're probably going to get audited, um, paper patching, and tiponoscopy tube uh, in, in the office. Um, when you report this code, and this is important, the reason why I put this whole slide up is you have to append a 25 modifier to the EMM code. Um, now, payers, this is the problem with payers. Um, this is uh, the, the rough vignette for removal of impacted strumen. So, <clears throat> And it may be hard to read, but they have a vignette where it involves, you actually have to talk to the patient and get a brief history. And then you take the wax out and then you talk to them afterwards. Uh, that's not that different from an evaluation and management. And so payers are using this in many cases to say, hey, look, you can't bill an e &M code the same day you take out wax because you know the work of actually seeing the patient is is included in the procedure. Now, uh, taking at wax is, I think, worth 0.6 work RVUs, which is less than a regular E&M. Um, so I think clearly it it's, uh, you know, a, a separate E&M or E&M visit in itself is not truly included in it or wasn't intended to, uh, not included in 69210, but it, 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 some payers will argue that it has been. And this is important because um, if if uh, you get a high a higher value paying code such as nasal endoscopy and debridement, um, which is worth more than E and M's, and you try to report them at the same time, you could you could find yourself in trouble. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys caught wind of this, but um, uh, for Mass Ioneer, uh, lots of nasal endoscopies and, and flexible fiber optic laryngoscopies that are performed at the same time as e &M, which they did do, um, uh, Medicare and Mass Health, there was a ruling saying that you know, you're not supposed to do uh, an E&M with these, these office procedures. Hopefully they won't turn an eye to microscopy, which is worth, I think, 0.18 work RVUs. 
as well as sermon impacts and because that would be uh, devastating. So, so there's an ongoing battle um, with payers saying we're not going to pay for anything uh, with the 25 modifier. Uh, you get either the EMM or the procedure or both. Um, just keep an eye out for it. And one way to pseudo protect yourself from this is to is to put a different diagnosis code. So if you see a patient for chronic otitis media and you look in with a microscope and you clean out truly impacted cerumen off the eardrum that impedes your ability to evaluate the ear. Um, don't just report chronic otitis media as your diagnosis. Report the separate cerumen impaction as, as the reason why you removed impacted cerumen. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know for sure what exactly happened here, but I understand that that may have been a component of is that they build for uh, maybe for example, and again, I'm not certain that what happened there is this this case, but maybe they, they build an EM visit for cancer surveillance and they use the one code for, you know, history of head and neck cancer. And uh, you, you might arguably be able to perform a, a separate procedure if there's an, an, a specific indication for it, say head and neck cancer, as well as say epistaxis. But I think to put it under one code is may have been part of the reason or one, see, ICD-10 code is a reason why um, something like this happened. And finally, one of the banes of my existence here, um, why this is important. Um, so we've all done Bajas. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody out there that truly likes uh, percutaneous uh, abutments. Um, uh, they, they tend to have wound problems and issues and and the um, Baja track had some promise in that you, you didn't have the percutaneous abutment in place. Uh, you had a magnet underneath the skin attached to the implant and you'd have a vibratory component on the outside that would couple with the internal magnet. And it turns out you don't get a whole lot of gain from that. Uh, and the only individual that I personally would ever consider doing this for is, is somebody who has a perfect bone line. Um, and uh, so that, that was kind of disappointing. So we, we, we came up with these new devices, or, or Medel and, and, uh, and Cochlear came up with new devices that have an active um, transcutaneous process, the uh, Cochlear Osseo or the Medel bone bridge. And, and coming to the market hopefully soon will be the, the um, Oticon Sentio. Um, where the vibratory components actually buried underneath the scalp, uh, fixed to the bone, so you have less attenuation of the scalp um, because the vibratory components actually seated in the bone already. Well, uh, somebody asked because um, the Baja tract was different from a regular percutaneous abutment. Um, somebody asked how to report a Baja tract to the AMA, and, and the re response was, well, you got to use unlisted because the actual definition of a your 69714 is a percutaneous system. Well, this is not percutaneous, unfortunately. And this, when this came out, many of us were trapped because a lot of us wanted to offer our patients the osseo, uh, but we'd get stuck with an unlisted code if we're doing things properly. Um, and you know, doing procedures for free, unlisted, is great if there weren't a $15,000 device that somebody had to pay for. And so um, we were trapped with this. Um, the uh, 69714 code for the amount of work that's done over time uh, was worth uh, 14 work RVUs, which is a lot for procedures that should take 15 to 20 minutes. But you know, before when you had to do the skin graft and the skin thinning and so on and so forth, that would take you know, a few hours. Um, we didn't want to open up that, that code set for revaluation, but unfortunately this kind of trapped us. So, um, so after much ado, um, beginning of this year, we now have a specific code for the, uh, the, um, cochlear osseo and the Medel bone bridge. And this is actually going to change, uh, hopefully next year into a more difficult, uh, it, this will break down into more difficult um, uh, versus less difficult uh, active transcutaneous um, device intended primarily for the osseo versus 
the osseo in an intramastoid bone bridge versus an extramastoid bone bridge placement. You guys aware that we have this code out now? No. Hi, Kevin. I was not aware. Yeah, this is this is it, and it's been valued by CMS, so it's it's been accepted. It's gonna it's not gonna pay as much as even a regular percutaneous uh, Baja, but at least the device will get covered, and uh, that that that's important. So, um, in conclusion, I think one of the biggest points I'm trying to get across here is take time to fill out those rock surveys if you get them. Again, they're important. They're, they're the only thing that they'll accept for our arguments for valuation of codes. Um, the, uh, the, act, the, the Baja codes, the, the Baja codes and the uh, Osea bone bridge codes, the active transcutaneous codes, we had to send out three times um, because evaluations weren't weren't um, making making sense, uh, and we needed some consistency. And when you fill out these RUC surveys, it's not it's not a time to brag about how fast you are. Uh, somebody apparently filled out uh, an Osea survey saying he could do it in five minutes from skin to skin. That is that is not what we need. Not a time to brag about time. Just be honest. Um, Try to use the most precise code. Don't try to put a, uh, Don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole. And and ask. You can ask me for help if you're uncertain about how to report a certain procedure. Finally, it's kind of depressing talk, but uh, you know the good thing about medicine is, in general, none of us are going to be living in a poor house. You know, we can afford to go to the Super Bowl when your team actually goes, and we can actually win. Um, and if this uh, whole billing and coding process gets you depressed, go on a mission trip. Uh, and this kind of refreshes, uh, I find this to be very refreshing, although it's a lot of work, it's very refreshing in that you do, uh, you do medicine for what, what you originally signed up for, um, which, is, which is nice. We went to Antigua, Guatemala, and I would go down there and do about 10 to 15 ear cases in four days, and it was, it was actually nice. Not a lot of equipment, not a lot of rules, though. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.